Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor, and here with me is my co-host, Eric. Hello. Today, we will be discussing the sinking of SS Laurentic, a White Star Line ocean liner famous for chasing down a murderer. Before we dive in, we must inform you. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, murder, capital punishment, wartime violence, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before we begin that neither Eleanor nor I are mariners or experts in the field of maritime history, but we have done our research and will present the information as we understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, we'll be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description below for anyone who needs it. Today there will be some terms in the Japanese language in which neither Eleanor nor I are fluent, but we'll do our best to give accurate pronunciations. Thanks, Derek. Before we really get into SS Laurentic and her history, we have to set the scene. The Dominion Line was a transatlantic passenger line that was in competition with lines like the Allen Line, the German Lloyd Line, Cunard Line, and White Star Line. They ran a transatlantic passenger service between Liverpool, Quebec, Montreal, and Boston, much like the Canadian Pacific Steamship Company. However, in 1902, the International Mercantile Marine Company, or IMM for short, bought the Dominion Line. Now, IMM practically had a monopoly on the transatlantic passenger trade at one point, acquiring many British and American steamship companies. For anyone who is not familiar, IMM, originally called the International Navigation Company, was a trust formed in the early 20th century by J.P. Morgan in an attempt to completely monopolize the shipping trade, specifically across the Atlantic Ocean. Long story short, the company was not successful and began to fall apart in the 1920s, completely dissolving into the United States lines by 1943. And yes, that is the same J.P. Morgan who created Chase Bank and would violently chase off photographers. What? Yeah, the man hated having his picture taken. 1905, stark rival to the Dominion Line, Allen Line, introduced the first ocean liners to run off steam turbine engines, RMS Victorian and RMS Virginian. They were the fastest ships on the UK to Canada route and displaying more than 10,600 gross registered tons of pop, they were also the largest. The pair was so impressive that the Allen Line won a lucrative Canadian government mail contract before the ships even hit the water. All of the earliest steam turbine ships, including Victorian and Virginian, had direct drive from their turbines to the propellers. They also used more bunker fuel than triple or quadruple expansion steam engines, making them unreliable when it came to fuel consumption. Now since these Allen Line ocean liners were so successful, the Dominion Line responded. In 1907, the Dominion Line ordered two large ocean liners from Harlan and Wolf, each displacing almost 15,000 gross registered tons, making them the largest ships in the Dominion Line's fleet and the largest ships taking the Britain to Canada route across the Atlantic. Originally, these ships were planned to be named Alberta and Albany. However, before their construction was completed, IMM moved them to a different one of its subsidiaries, the White Star Line. To keep in line with the traditional IC suffix for their fleet, the ships were then named SS Megantic and SS Laurentic. Though they changed hands, their route between Liverpool and Montreal would stay the same, and they were the first of White Star Line ships to sail this route. Before we go any further, let's look at the schematics of these two ships since they were built with one key difference between them, their engines. SS Megantic was built with two propellers driven by conventional quadruple expansion steam engines, whereas Laurentic was somewhat more experimental. She had three screws and a turbine drove the middle propeller, with four-cylinder triple expansion steam engines driving her port and starboard screws. The exhaust steam from their low-pressure cylinders was what drove the turbine. If it worked to plan, it would be efficient and speedy. She displaced exactly 14,892 gross registered tons, capable of carrying 230 first-class passengers, 430 second-class passengers, and 1,000 third-class passengers with a crew of 387 during civilian service and 470 during wartime service. She was 550.4 feet long, had a beam of 67.3 feet, and a depth of 41.2 feet, spanning three decks. She was painted traditional White Star Line colors, a white superstructure, oak deck, black hull, red keel, and one orange smokestack with the tip painted black. 
She was built in yard number 394 of the Harland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast, Ireland, being launched off the sixth slipway in the south yard on September 10, 1908. She would be completed on April 15, 1909 after passing her sea trials and having things here and there tweaked, as all ships do. SS Laurentic was not the first ship to have, quote, combination machinery, which is what the multiple turbine and engine types would be known as. A refrigerated cargo liner, Otaki, was launched just a month before Laurentic on August 15, 1908 by William Denny and Brothers. The advantage SS Laurentic had over Otaki was having her sister ship Megantic, because this way IMM, White Star Line, and Harland and & Wolf could directly compare the performance of the engines in both ships at the same time. And when comparing the sisters, they found that SS Laurentic produced 20% more power than Megantic for the same amount of coal consumption. And when comparing power outputs, Laurentic's coal consumption was 12-15% to 15 less than Megantic's. Pretty impressive. Because of these amazing developments, IMM quickly ordered a similar three-screw combination of two triple expansion engines and one low-pressure turbine for the Olympic-class ocean liners launched in 1910 and 1911. Those two ships were RMS Olympic and RMS Titanic. So without SS Laurentic, RMS Olympic and RMS Titanic would not have been as fast and impressive as they were known to be. As for her passenger service, SS Laurentic and SS Megantic joined two Dominion Line ships, the Canada and the Dominion, to run weekly joint services between Liverpool and Canada. Remember, since IMM owned both White Star Line and Dominion Lines, this put the money directly into JP Morgan's pocket no matter what so he did not see conflict running four ships of two subsidiaries on the same route. On April 29, 1909, SS Laurentic left Liverpool on her maiden voyage for Quebec and Montreal, reaching both on May 7th. Although the exact number is unknown in her five years of service, SS Laurentic would transport thousands and thousands of immigrants from the UK to Canada. That's immigrants with an E, by the way. The difference is that you're an immigrant when you're leaving your home country and become an immigrant with an I when you land in your new country. In the winter, SS Laurentic also made trips to New York City. And on one of those crossings to New York on January 22, 1910, a nasty storm hit the Laurentic so hard that it burst the portholes on her upper deck, flooding the bridge and officers' quarters and also disabling the engine order telegraphs. Engine order telegraphs are communication devices that look like big circles on poles with a lever that changes what position it is in. This goes down to the engine room and, for example, can be changed from full ahead to full astern, meaning from go to stop. The Laurentic was able to be repaired, luckily, and she didn't suffer the porthole problem again. During the winter, she was also used for cruises in the West Indies and the Mediterranean Sea. For any of you true crime fans, here's where her SS Laurentic's story gets juicy. A man by the name of Holly Harvey Crippen murdered his wife, Cora, on January 31st, 1910, when she mysteriously disappeared. Initially, he told the police that she had gone across the Atlantic to the United States, and later claimed she died in California and she was cremated. He did this so his lover, Ethel Lenave Neve, could move into his home, the Hilltop Crescent, and enjoy Cora's jewelry and clothing. The police first heard of Cora Crippen's disappearance from her friend, but they didn't take the matter seriously until a personal friend of Scotland Yard urged them to investigate. The home was searched, with no evidence being found, and Chief Inspector Walter Dew interviewed Holly Crippen. In his interview, he admitted that he had lied about the story of his wife having passed away in California. Instead of confessing his crime, he lied again, saying he was embarrassed because Cora had actually left him and fled to America with a lover, claiming this lover to be the music hall actor Bruce Miller. Walter Dew seemed to be satisfied enough with the story and left Hilltop Crescent. However, Crippen and Lenev thought for sure their goose was cooked, and so they fled in a panic to Brussels, Belgium, spending the night in a hotel. The following morning, they packed up again and moved on to Antwerp, Belgium, boarding the Canadian Pacific liner SS Montrose to escape to Canada. Now, often with serial killers and murderers, it's hasty actions like this that gets them caught. It's the same in this case. Because of their frantic getaway, Scotland Yard performed another three sweeps of the house. During their fourth and final search, they found the torso of a human body buried under the brick flooring in the basement. This was unfortunately Cora Crippen. William Wilcox, who would later be knighted and become senior scientific analyst to the Home Office, 
found traces of the calming drug scopolamine in the torso. Scopolamine, also known as hyoscine or devil's breath, is a natural or synthetically produced tropane alkaloid and anticholinergic drug that is formally used as a medication for treating motion sickness, vomiting, a post-operative nausea. It's also used sometimes before surgery to reduce the amount of saliva produced by the body. Common side effects include sleepiness, blurred vision, dilated pupils, and dry mouth. So, with her sleepy and unable to see straight, Cora was murdered in cold blood by her husband. Her body was successfully identified using a piece of skin from the abdomen, though her head, limbs, and skeleton were never recovered. The remains that were found were interred at the St. Pancras and Islington Cemetery in East Finchley, North London. This is interesting and all, but what does it have to do with SS Laurentic? I'm so glad you asked. While Crippen and Lenev, disguised as a boy, were crossing the Atlantic on the SS Montrose, they were recognized by Captain Henry George Kendall. Just before steaming beyond the range of his shipboard transmitter, he had his telegraphist Lawrence Ernest Hughes send a wireless telegram back to Britain to Scotland Yard. It read, quote, Have strong suspicions that Crippen, London cellar murderer, and accomplice are among saloon passengers. Mustache taken off, growing beard. Accomplice dressed as boy, manner and build undoubtedly a girl. If Crippen had decided to travel third class instead of the first class, which was often catered to much more by staff and the captain himself, he might not have been recognized. This is where SS Laurentic comes in. Chief Inspector Walter Dew boarded the much faster SS Laurentic and raced across the Atlantic, arriving in Quebec before Crippen and contacting the Canadian authorities. When Montrose entered the St. Lawrence River, Dew came aboard disguised as a pilot. Since Canada at this time was still a dominion within the British Empire, he was able to be extradited to the UK easily. Working together, Kendall asked Crippen and Lenev if they would like to meet the pilots, and they obliged. Once Dew approached Crippen, he removed his cap and said, quote, Good morning, Dr. Crippen. Do you know me? I'm Chief Inspector Dew from Scotland Yard. At first, Crippen seemed surprised, but he said this to Dew, quote, Thank God it's over. The suspense has been too great. I couldn't stand it any longer. He then was arrested alongside Lenev without resistance and transported back to the UK on SS Megantic. He was tried on October 18, 1910, the proceedings only lasting four days. He would be sentenced to death and hanged in Pentonville Prison, London, on November 23, 1910 for the murder of his wife, Cora Crippen. His lover, Lenev, was only charged as an accessory and was later acquitted. Quite the story for S.S. Laurentic to be a part of. After this, her passenger service wasn't quite as exciting. In 1911, she set a westbound record time for the Canadian route of 13 days and 4 hours between Liverpool and Montreal. By 1912, she was equipped for wireless telegraphy, and on a westbound crossing that year on April 29th, she passed over the spot where RMS Titanic sank just two weeks earlier. Captain John Mathias of Laurentic reported by wireless on April 21st that he had kept a careful lookout while passing over the Grand Banks, and had seen neither bodies nor wreckage. Still, it must have been ominous and eerie to pass over the same spot where 1,496 passengers had passed just two weeks earlier. As World War I spread about the world starting July 28, 1914, ships were requisitioned for wartime service. SS Laurentic was no different, and she was requisitioned as an armed merchant cruiser and troop ship on September 13, 1914 at Montreal, where she would be painted navy gray like most other warships. There, she loaded 15,000 sacks of flour and embarked the 1st Battalion, the Royal Canadian Dragoons. After that, on October 3rd, she left Gaspé Bay in Quebec as one of 32 ships in a convoy bringing more than 30,000 soldiers of the Canadian Expeditionary Force to Europe to fight. She reached Plymouth, England on October 14, 1914. From there, she was armed with naval guns and powder guns, being commissioned on November 25, 1914 as HMS Laurentic Pennant No. M71. From then on, she was a soldier herself. In December of 1914, HMS Laurentic left Liverpool for Cameroon, where she would assist in the Cameroon Campaign. This campaign focused on liberating the German colony of Cameroon in the African theater of World War I, and it was successful by the spring of 1916. 
In September of 1914, the Royal Navy had captured multiple German merchant ships that were seeking refuge in the Wari Estuary, also known as the Cameroon Estuary in Cameroon, West Africa. From December 26th to 30th of that year, Laurentic discharged prize crews from five of these captured German ships. A prize crew is a select number of crewmen chosen to take over operating a captured ship, like the German merchant ships. From January 1915 to April of 1916, she lurked seas all over from Africa to China, patrolling, boarding enemy ships, and transporting troops. Nothing enamorous happened, nothing truly devastating. However, she did transfer gold, and that is an interesting part of her story. HMS Laurentic was birthed as Simonstown, a naval base in South Africa near Cape Town from July 17th to the 19th of 1916, then bunkering in Cape Town on the 20th, and then finally on July 23rd to 24th, loading bullion to transport to Canada. Bullion, also known as specie, is a non-ferrous metal that has been refined to a high standard of purity, and this can apply to many metals like silver and gold. On July 25, 1916, HMS Laurentic departed Cape Town, South Africa for Halifax, Nova Scotia, reaching Halifax by August 15th of that year. There, she offloaded her cargo of specie. After that, she spent all of September and the first half of October patrolling the seas on the east coast of Canada before moving south to Bermuda, where she spent October 14th through the 27th in port and loaded more bullion. By October 30th, she was back in Halifax and unloaded her precious cargo, spending four weeks in port where departing again on November 27th to head home to Liverpool. Remember the stories of her transporting gold, because much like RMS Empress of Britain, it is rumored she sank with some aboard. Now we head into the sinking of HMS Laurentic. So far in her story, she became a White Star Ocean Liner that was revolutionary in the build of her engine, chased down a murderous duo, and became a gold-toting, ass-kicking soldier ship. Unfortunately for Laurentic and her crew, she would not remain so lucky as to end her career in the scrapyard. Instead, she found herself at the bottom of the sea. For her sinking, we will be going off of her logbooks and eyewitness accounts to determine what happened to the vessel. According to the logbook, on December 23, 1916, she was in Birkenhead where she was again loaded with specie. This might be referring to the top secret 3,211 gold bars she was carrying to buy munitions for the war effort from Canada and the US. At the time, they were worth 5 million pounds. Since we don't know how much these gold bars weighed, which helps us determine worth, so with estimating their weight, they would be worth roughly between 10.1 million pounds to 99.8 million pounds today. Needless to say, it was incredibly valuable for the war effort. By January 23rd of 1917, she departed Birkenhead, but had to stop at Bonkrana in Luffswilly to disembark four ratings who showed signs of yellow fever. A rating in the Royal Navy is an enlisted sailor who ranks below warrants officers and commissions officers, but does include petty officers and chief petty officers. At 5 p.m., she left Bunkrana in a swirling cold blizzard. The cold air bit at the noses of the sailors left aboard, but they had to keep their eyes sharp. There had been reports that a U-boat had been sighted in the area near the mouth of Lof Swilly. HMS Laurentic was supposed to rendezvous with a destroyer escort off of Faned Head, but Captain Reginald Norton, her master, chose to forego this. At 5.55 p.m., HMS Laurentic struck a sea mine. This sea mine lay just north of the mouth of the low that SMU-80 had laid. It exploded right at HMS Laurentic's foremast. Twenty seconds later, a second mine exploded next to the engine room, which immediately disabled her dynamo and pumps. The crew were unable to send out a wireless distress message because of the engine room failure, but fired a distress rocket into the sky. Both explosions were on the port side, and quickly she started to list to 20 degrees on the port side, which made it difficult to launch lifeboats. Most davits had a hard time launching lifeboats when the list was more than 10 to 15 degrees. A davit is a small crane on board a ship, usually used to suspend or lower lifeboats. They can be operated with manual or electric winches. Immediately, the crew knew HMS Laurentic was doomed. They did end up launching lifeboats and attempted to row ashore, guided by the nearby Fanad Head Lighthouse. Unfortunately, the temperature dropped down to 9 degrees Fahrenheit, and sadly many of the men in the lifeboats passed away due to hypothermia before they had a chance to reach the shore. 
Local fishing boats rescued the exhausted sailors that were left. About 45 minutes after the explosions, Captain Norton used a flashlight to search the ship for survivors. He then boarded a lifeboat, being the last to leave the ship, an honorable captain indeed. He is quoted as stating the following, quote, To the best of my knowledge, all the men got safely into the boats. The best of order prevailed after the explosion. The officers and men lived up to the best traditions of the Navy. The deaths were all due to exposure, owing to the coldness of the night. My own boat was almost full of water when we were picked up by a trawler the next morning, but all the men in the boat survived. Another boat, picked up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, contained five survivors and 15 frozen bodies. They had been exposed to the bitter cold for over 20 hours. To me, this sounds like a responsible captain who kept a level head and did the best he could to save his men, and knew what was going on to the best of his ability. Hats off to Captain Reginald Norton for doing the right thing. It's sometimes rare in these stories, and it's always refreshing to see such discipline, honor, and courage in these situations. Later, another boat that was found 20 hours after the sinking contained 17 dead men from hypothermia. In total, 354 men were killed, leaving only 121 survivors. Of these survivors, 12 were officers and 109 were ratings. A civic reception was held for the survivors in Guildhall Dairy, and there, each man received a 10-shilling note and a packet of cigarettes. That's it? Yep, but I guess it's better than nothing. As for the deceased, it took weeks for the corpses to wash ashore to be buried. 71 of the dead were buried in a mass grave at St. Mira's Parish Churchyard in Vahan, Ireland. One of the men is buried at Bunkrana, one washed ashore on Heisker, 150 miles away, and was buried there. A few of them were buried elsewhere in order to be buried with their families or in their place of birth, including Hollywood and Tolish in Arklow and West Derby in Liverpool. Unfortunately for the families, many of the dead were never recovered from the sea. They are commemorated and honored on Royal Navy monuments at Chatham, Portsmouth, and Plymouth. Remember earlier when we talked about gold bullion? That gold was stored in the second-class baggage room, and a crew of Royal Navy salvage divers was deployed to recover it, including HMS Laurentix diver P.O. Augustus Dent, who had luckily survived the sinking. The team was led by a specialist in deep-water diving, Captain Goibon de Mont and they ended up finding the wreckage at a depth of roughly 120 feet down, with the ship listing 60 degrees to port. Initially, the wreck was pretty much intact other than the holes blown in the side of it. DeMont and his team of divers used gun cotton, made of nitrocellulose, to blow open one of the watertight doors that is called the entry port that is midway on the ship's side, as well as an iron gate in the companionway that led to the baggage room. Nitrocellulose is a highly flammable compound formed by nitrating cellulose through exposure to a mixture of nitric acid and sulfuric acid, initially being used as gun cotton, which is a replacement for gunpowder as a propellant in firearms. Essentially, they used high-powered explosives, but a diver by the name of E.C. Miller still needed to use a hammer and chisel to open the baggage room door. Each box containing gold was 1 foot by 1 foot by 6 inches and weighed 140 pounds, and due to the weight and awkward angle of the wreck at 60 degrees, it was incredibly arduous effort. Each box was carefully and awkwardly hoisted up the entry port back up to the surface by E.C. Miller, and in two days he'd recovered four boxes, each one being worth 8,000 pounds. They only got four boxes because after the fourth was raised, gale force winds whipped over the ocean and it was too dangerous to continue the dive, and so DeMont suspended the salvage for the time being. These heavy winds and seas lasted about a week, and when the divers returned, they felt disappointment settle into their shoulders. The entire wreck looked like someone had stepped on it, and SS Laurentic was crushed. The divers must have languished as they stared at it. Originally, that entry port they were hoisting gold out of was about 60 feet above the ocean floor, and now it was buried down at about 103 feet. The companionway that led to the baggage room was smashed in on itself, leaving only 18 inches of wiggle room between the floor and ceiling. The divers used more explosives to force ceiling up, shoring it up, and swimming toward the baggage room, only to be further disappointed. Its floor had burst open, and the precious gold they were there to retrieve was gone. But why was the gold gone? And why was S.S. Laurentic crushed? 
It was very easy to figure out with one of the human senses, listening. The wreck was very loud, with creaking metal and groaning indicating that the wreck was still moving and settling, making her a dangerous dive. The companionway lay beneath five decks, and each time they dived into it, they risked being caught in a catastrophic collapse. Demont then decided to scrap any plans of going this route again, instead creating a new plan to use explosives to remove the main mast and make a vertical shaft down into the wreck, where he predicted the gold rested now. The work was already dangerous enough drilling through an unsettled wreck without the Royal Navy's minesweepers detonating German mines they found, with one even exploding just two nautical miles from the wreck. After this scare, Demont refused to die when the minesweepers were out within five nautical miles of Laurentic, and this slowed progress. Even with this precaution, a mine detonated six nautical miles gave one of the divers what Demont described as quote a severe blow, whatever that means. After two months of strenuous, dangerous work, the shaft was completed, and they retrieved one part of the gold that was left. It was Demont's belief that by this time, the gold was now split into two main parts. And as the wreck shifted and broke apart, E. C. Miller found ten loose gold bars from a box that had split open. By September, the weather was once again getting worse, and De Demont was forced to stop work on the wreck. By this time in 1917, they had hauled up 542 gold bars, estimated to be worth 800,000 pounds at that time. In 1918, De Demont and his crew were tasked with other jobs. Being unable to return to SS Laurentic until 1919, HMS Racer was employed as their new, more reliable diving support vessel. And as the season progressed, it became tougher and tougher to find gold. They managed to haul up 315 bars in 1919, estimating a value of 470,000 pounds. Unfortunately, during the winter between 1919 and 1920, the superstructure entirely collapsed around their work site. Filling in the holes made in 1917 and 1919, the current and the tides swept in stone, sand, and silt from the seabed that gunked up the wreckage, making it difficult to dive now. But they were determined to find the rest of the gold. So, with that determination in mind, they turned to quite literally searching with their bare hands for this missing gold. In 1920, the crew tried dredging grabs and centrifugal pumps, but there were not enough space to do this, and the time slots when they were able to do this were so short due to poor weather. In nice weather, the divers were working by hand, with the strong currents from bad weather filling the holes they dug with sand. In the summer of 1920, they only managed to take out seven gold bars, being able to remove 43 bars the following summer when they removed massive amounts of the ship's structure. The winter months between 1921 and 1922 saw a turnaround, with the currents washing away some of the debris that had settled over the wreck, and divers finding gold bars sticking out of the sand and glittering on the ocean floor within the remnants of the wreckage. The bars were now more spread out, but with the weather cooperating, they managed to salvage 895 gold bars between April and October, with the gold being worth roughly 1.5 million pounds. In one single day, the divers found a group of bars worth 150,000 pounds, still sitting in what remained of their boxes. Most of the bars were below a thick layer of sand, silt, and mud, between 18 inches and 24 inches deep. Using a fire hose lowered into the sea from HMS Racer, they sprayed away the silt and mud. Though this would make visibility horrendous. Think of kicking the sand at the bottom of a lake, but 20 times worse. Though they wore standard diving gear for the time. They chose to use their bare hands to dig through the sand and feel around for gold bars, which they would recognize the feeling of on their fingertips. Because of this, they rubbed their fingertips raw, like scrubbing sandpaper on their fingers, and would agonize after a long workday from the stinging pain. It was effective, however, and in 1923 alone, they recovered 1,255 gold bars, worth almost two million pounds. Each diver received a half crown for each 100 pounds of gold recovered. For anyone unfamiliar with this currency, a half crown is a denomination of sterling coinage that is worth one eighth of one pound, or two shillings in six pence. When the crew and HMS Racer returned bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in the spring of 1924, Demont and his divers received even more good news. The winter currents had once again cleared away much of the debris and sand from the bottom of the hole. Except this time, there were no shiny gold bars poking out of the sand, 
but there were holes in the steel plating on the hull where the gold had been resting, meaning it must have gone through the steel plating. And a few had. They did find some bars by reaching their hands through these holes, eventually having to crawl underneath the steel plating to retrieve more gold. The divers ended up hauling 129 more gold bars out of the wreckage of SS Laurentic before the winter of 1924 set in. Out of all their salvage dives, 3,186 of the 3,211 missing gold bars were retrieved by DeMont and his team of skilled divers. The cost of this work was 128,000 pounds, which was roughly 2-3% to of the value of the gold they found. To date, this has been the most successful salvage for gold bars on a wreck but 25 gold bars remained with the wreckage at this time. DeMont would be made a CBE in June of 1924, with multiple members of the diving crew being awarded the Medal of the Order of the British Empire that December. In the 1930s, there was a private salvage done by a British company to pick up where the Royal Navy and DeMont's team had left off, but they had only managed to find three more gold bars, leaving 22 still up for grabs. In the 1950s, a different group of salvagers dug a trench into the seabed, roughly 40 feet long and 18 feet deep, but they were unsuccessful. Later in the 60s, two brothers named Eric and Ray Cossum bought the salvage rights, and in the 1980s, a Dutch company went in looking for the remaining 22 bars, but also had no luck. The other remaining gold bars are said still to be down there. As for the wreckage, she still remains between 98 and 131 feet down off of Fanid and Malin Head, broken up by the years of salvaging, strong currents, and damage from silt and debris. However, her large scotch boilers and other big chunks of her remain identifiable. Ray Cossum still owns the salvage rights to the wreck. Being that she is in the waters of the Republic of Ireland, she is automatically protected as the National Monument by the National Monuments Act 1987. All divers must obtain a license before diving, and it's still a risky one. This episode hopes to remember the victims and survivors of the sinking of SS Laurentic, and to honor their sacrifice. Thank you to those who not only served on SS Laurentic during her wartime service, but to all veterans for your contribution. If this podcast has taught us anything, it is that war is ugly, and veterans make the ultimate sacrifice, in many cases, fighting for the freedom of others. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you like this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to the channel. If you like this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review, as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and we'll get it on our schedule. Check out Speed Force Media on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Shipwreck Sunday. Tune in next Sunday for the story of SS Arandora Star, a Blue Star Line ocean liner sunk off the coast of Ireland in World War II. We also have exciting news for you Shipwreck fans. There will be a Halloween special released at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Halloween Day on the Mary Celeste, a famous ghost ship. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.